Salutations, viewers, I'm Sir Bookwriter, and I'm on a race against the calendar to beat all 96 of my 200cc time trial runs before the year ends. Last time, DK Mountain went down, and then... No! Yeah. Let's talk about it. Big Blue is the final track in the Bell Cup, and the final track of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe's base game. This is yet another fan-favorite track. Most casual players love the F-Zero aesthetic, high speeds, energetic music, cool shortcuts. The list goes on. At some point in the past, I was among those casuals. In fact, Big Blue is my favorite track of the base 48, and my second favorite in the entire Mario Kart franchise. So why the negative reaction? Before I answer that, let me give you some backstory. One quick thing to note going forward. Mario Kart games run at 60 frames per second, and in time trials, exact milliseconds are calculated based on your cart position the frame you cross the finish line. However, this only works when crossing the same finish line in the same direction. So section tracks like Big Blue and Mount Wario were stuck going by frames, with each and every final time ending in one of these numbers. Thus, ties were a lot more common on these tracks. Don't even get me started on the tracks where you cross the line backwards because that is an oddity within itself. With floaty physics and a twisty layout, Big Blue 200cc was a hot category upon the release of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Heck, even the first recorded world record flew across half of Section 2. This cut was affectionately dubbed the Big Blue Ultra, named after Mario Kart Wii's notorious ultra shortcuts. Unlike its namesake, however, this cut doesn't go out of bounds or skip any checkpoints. It just looks cool. American player Jimmy established himself early on as a dominant force in the world record scene, especially on Big Blue. He went basically uncontested on the track until June 2017, when Japanese player Potch nabbed his first record. A month and a half later, another American player, Miguel, rose up to contest Potch. The two would trade the record back and forth, gradually improving their driving and strats into the lower 101 range. Potch pulled ahead in 2018, keeping his reign almost 500 days. Until one day in 2019, which contained perhaps the biggest discovery the track will ever see. Up until this point, the Ultra was done by landing from S1's glider on the right side, flying over to the left, releasing a UMT, and then drifting off the upper path and flying all the way down. On June 22nd, 2019, Japanese player Otohime unveiled a new world record of 101.183, with a very noticeably amazing S2. Looking at his run, Otohime lands on the left side instead of the right, and takes the lower path during the Ultra. This strat has since been dubbed Low Ultra, and saves an estimated quarter of a second overtaking the top route, now deemed High Ultra. This discovery pushed not just Potch back to the track, but also Jimmy and Miguel in a race to sub 101. During this race, another important discovery was made. Since release, the combo had stayed largely the same, being Wario or Dry Bowser on the Ink Striker with wood or slim tires and an Excel glider. This combo boasts the best anti-gravity speed in the game, and considering Big Blue has almost exclusively anti-gravity, it wasn't a stretch to say that this combo was fast here. However, the mini turbo stat left a bit to be desired, and once a UMT shroom strat was found in section 1, Jimmy swapped the combo to leaf tires, which have a significantly better MT stat, in exchange for a slower, but still serviceable anti-gravity speed. Jimmy also swapped from the Ink Striker to the Mach 8. The two cards actually share stats, but Jimmy used the Mach 8 because he hated how the Ink Striker handled. The Mach 8 also turned out to be faster long term, as its wider hitbox allowed players to hang off of edges and take some corners tighter. Eventually, Potch was the first one to break through the barrier, and Miguel tied him two days later. Potch, Jimmy, Miguel, and Dotohime would each set a few more records, until October, when a new challenger appeared on the scene, Japanese player Almond. After Almond set his first record, none of the four Heavenly Kings of Big Blue set a record on this category again. Within two weeks of setting his first world record, Almond set perhaps one of the strongest records in the game at the time, a 
This record stood for the rest of 2019, and well into 2020, when another new challenger entered the fray. You might have heard of this guy. This is Japanese player Ronnie. Ronnie started out by tying Allman 750 on April 18th, 2020, and later that day lowered it to 733. In June, Ronnie took it down to 700 on the 24th, and then set the first point six, a 100.666. This record would not only stand as the longest lasting record on the track, but also one of only two videos on the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe World Records YouTube channel to surpass 1 million views. It's undeniable that this was an iconic record on all fronts. Iconic for the more casual enjoyers of the game because, ooh, big shortcuts. But also iconic for the time trial scene, because this was arguably the strongest record in the game when it was set. It was made all the more iconic 307 days later on April 30th, 2021, when Almond came back one last time to tie Ronnie. Almond's run was a bit faster than Ronnie going into S3, but lost a bit of time at the very end of the run, resulting in a tie instead of a new record. This tie would last until August 21st, where Ronnie would improve with a new strat, Motion Glider. I talked about Motion Glider already, but Big Blue's motion is notable because it saves... one frame. Yep. However, that one frame was enough, resulting in Ronnie breaking the tie and getting a 650. One thing to note is that between Almond's run and now, Ronnie had tied his 666 more than 10 times, and only now, thanks to a new strat, broke through. The next day, Ronnie would improve again to 633 with another new strat, an extra MT when landing from the cannon. This was discovered by Japanese player Yos, and as such is referred to as the Yos MT. The record scene went dormant once again, until May 1st, 2022, when yet another new strat was found. On the first coin panel in Section 1, it was normal to take as tight a line as possible and get four coins. However, German player Alpha discovered that by taking just a slightly wider line, you could get a fifth coin. Thanks to being under the effects of a boost panel, barely any time would be lost for the line adjustments, and the time gain in the latter half of the section was super noticeable, mainly at the glider landing, where you could land later to nab the one remaining coin instead of two. Alpha used this strat to tie Ronnie 633, which lasted until the end of the month, where Ronnie went on a rampage. The improvements finally stopped when Ronnie hit a 533 which even he thought was absolutely ridiculous. But keep in mind, dear viewer, we're still in 2022. A couple months after Ronnie's 533, a new person would rise up to challenge him. This was Japanese player F.A. F.A. had been playing the track for a long time, but one day, something changed, and he started getting insane splits, eventually tying Ronnie's 533 on July 22nd, 2022. Ronnie being tied was a common occurrence, it had been done twice before, but on September 12th, F.A. did something that no one had ever done before on Big Blue. He beat Ronnie's record. Now, I've been getting all these dates and screenshots from mkworldrecords.com, but one thing the site doesn't consistently do well is keep track of reigns that get tied. According to the site, Ronnie's record reign on Big Blue ended when Almond tied him at 666. But Ronnie never actually lost world record, until F.A. beat him a year and a half later. If Ronnie's reign was counted properly, it would have lasted nearly 900 days, and it'd still be in the top 50 of reigns today. That goes to show just how much of a monster Ronnie was on this track, and despite so many players coming so close, no one could actually manage to take the crown for themselves, until F.A. set a 500. That 500 would stand alone at the top for about a month, until Alberto arrived. 
Alberto deserves a history video on his own, but this is neither the time nor place for that. And Big Blue is actually one of his more silent showings anyways, as his only record on the track is tying FA's 500. What's notable about Alberto's run is his S3 split. For the time, this was considered by almost everyone to be at most a frame from total perfection. This tie probably would have lasted forever, too. But Nintendo had other plans. March 9th, 2023. The day Mario Kart 8 Deluxe got turned on its head. Many people have covered the effects of Wave 4 on the game as a whole, but how did it affect Big Blue specifically? For starters, the frame glitch got removed, so every millisecond is now possible on these section tracks. Hooray! Oh, and also the Mach 8 got its MT stat buffed. So even if the combo stayed the same, it'd be faster than what was there before. However, a new possibility crept into the mix. And only two players recognized this from the get-go. Ronnie was back. But more surprisingly, so too were the wood tires, with which Ronnie would set the first point four on March 14th. FA would strike back immediately, beating Ronnie by 5 milliseconds with the usual leaf tires. Ronnie came back the next day, beating FA by 4 milliseconds with Crimson Slims. FA took a couple of days, but eventually retaliated on the 17th with a 445. This record would last until August, where FA improved by another 3 milliseconds to a 442. And then on October 4th, something bizarre happened. The track saw its largest record improvement since Almond 750 in 2019. And it was done by a player the community had no contact with. Now, records have been set by no contact players before, and the community has found creative ways to contact them, be it by changing their names on the in-game leaderboards, or by perusing social media sites like YouTube or Twitter. However, the way Sonanoka was found takes the cake, because the community found him through his father's calligraphy TikTok. I wish I was making that up. What's more impressive is that while Sonanoka's run did host a new strat, a wall hit at the beginning of S2, not only did the time the strat saves not warrant that level of improvement, but also the way Sonanoka did it was slower overall, meaning it was pure driving skill that netted him this massive time save. Sonanoka's impressive improvement would be where the record history ends, too. But during this video's production, two more records were set. The first of which happened on January 28th. The first world record of Japanese player Toripi. The first point three on the track, and likely the last time this digit will ever change in a big blue 200cc world record. A 100.399. A month later, on February 24th, F.A. reclaimed the record with a 393. Normally in these videos I give a brief overview of the strats the current world record does. However, when I recorded that segment for this video, Toripi still had the world record, so I'll be talking about his run instead. Not that it matters much anyways, the only major visual difference between Toripi's run and F.A.'s is that F.A. does motion while Toripi does not. One last thing. I'm sure everyone watching this has had some kind of thought about the premise of a sub-minute happening eventually. Let me just clear something up. No, it's not currently possible. Not even close. The current best known splits of this track give a high point to, point .281 at the time of this recording, and all three are very close to their current theoretical limit. I mentioned in the DK Mountain episode that luck is a big factor in most speedrun categories. Most. Big Blue 200cc is one of the mythical few categories, across speedrunning as a whole, that the concept of luck does not affect. I bring this up because this lack of random time save means the run is consistent. So long as you're skilled enough, you can pull off the same run every time without fail. This also means there's no way to gain half a second by rolling a nat 20. The current best known splits are a very good indicator of how far down this track can go. And considering the category is nearly seven years old, 
as well as how many players are within a quarter of a second of the world record, it's safe to say that this is the most optimized category in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Sub-minute will not ever happen. But what if a new strat is found? I can already hear the keyboards chattering. Let me break this down as well. Low Ultra. The biggest discovery on the track since the Ultra itself. Saves a quarter of a second overtaking High Ultra. Another one of those groundbreaking, revolutionary strats would have to be found on the most optimized category in the game. And even then, the best-known splits wouldn't even give sub-minute. Every new strat found since Ronnie's iconic 666 barely saves time at all in the grand scheme of things. Motion, 10 milliseconds. Yos MT, up to 50 milliseconds. Five coin, up to 100 milliseconds. This counter hop after the second coin turn, 33 milliseconds. This extra MT found by FA in section three, 33 milliseconds. Balance patch that buffed the Mach 8 and made Slims faster again, approximately 100 milliseconds. It took a literal act of God to make point three even humanly feasible. And this wall hit found by Sonanoka saves maybe 20 milliseconds. Minus the balance patch, all of those smaller strats found over the years save a combined total of about a quarter of a second. The time save from all those minor optimizations over the years would have to be found again to even put a sub-minute run into speculation for Big Blue's top players. Trust us, we know what we're doing. Now then, let's actually take a look at Toripi's run and see what he does. You got boost power! Toripi starts rooms to reach top speed immediately. He does an MT, chains it into the boost panel, then charges up a UMT, collecting his five coins and hitting another boost panel along the way. Upon releasing the UMT, he starts another drift instantly. He takes the top path for coins, releases an SMT on top of the boost panel, then hops right and tricks. He lands as far right as possible and uses the boost from the trick to safely drift across the red conveyor into the green one. He holds his drift off the ramp and into the shroom cut, chaining the shroom into a UMT. He then hops twice to the left for alignment, waits a moment, then hops over the red conveyor and drifts across empty air to the other side. It's difficult to see, in fact, I don't have the tools for it right now, but the lack of two zones at this NISC are super unforgiving. One pixel too tight, and the run ends there. And there's no way to tell what's optimal except through trial and error. Landing from the NISC, Torepi releases his MT immediately and tricks off the glider, aiming for the far end of the left side coin panel. He lands in a drift, snags coin 10, and crosses into section 2. Toripi flies over this corner, releases his UMT, tricks off this ramp, hops over this small corner here, and drifts off the track for low ultra. The key to getting height for this is a combination of being as close to this railing as possible, and minimizing how often you move your control stick throughout. Once past the railing on the other side, Toripi lands, releases his SMT into a slip drift for another MT chaining the boost from that into Fast Glider. After not even bothering to perform the smallest motion time save in the game, Toripi lands in a drift for Yos MT. Tricking off the ramp into the conveyor section, Toripi quickly avoids staying on the red conveyors for too long while chaining boost panels. And on the last green conveyor, Toripi aligns himself with the very edge of the right ramp and does a super precise low trick, landing in another slip drift to the left around the hairpin. He releases his SMT super early and does a perfectly timed spin drift to avoid losing time from colliding with this wall. He charges an MT, then an SMT on the green path, staying super close to the wall the entire time. He somehow hits the spin booster and these last two boost panels before doing one last big air miss. He lands on the railing, tricks off the ramp, and shrooms through these two patches of off-road and hops out. This is not the way this is normally done as pretty much any other player hops over the first bit, uses their shroom before landing, and the shroom boost will safely take them all the way through. I'm unsure whether this was done due to panic or nerves, because the way Toripi does this is slightly slower. However, it still brought him in the record, so who am I to judge? After the shroom, all that's left to do is just hold A, and not fail to hitting this off-road, this railing, or nudging the control stick too harshly before the finish line. And now, let's talk about my history with the track. I won't be able to do this segment often, because for most other tracks my personal history boils down to 
I played it for a couple hours one day, and my opinion on it is slightly positive. However, this is a special case, because without Big Blue, there's a very high chance that this entire series would never exist. August 4th, 2019. I hopped into a call with my good friend Neon. That night we mainly played Smash Ultimate, but this call also marks the first documented footage of me time trialing Big Blue. I'd played 8 Deluxe casually for a bit up to that point, and I liked playing Mario Kart's Wii in 7, but never really invested into getting any better than the status of better than my friends and family. Time trials I had always treated as that mode that unlocks characters. However, that night I was bored. So I hopped into time trials and, for the first time in my life, I was going to try and get a Mario Kart world record. And what better place to do it than my favorite course in the game, Big Blue. I actually debated between it and Mount Wario for a bit, but ultimately decided on Big Blue. Some days I wonder what the timeline where I picked Mount Wario looks like. I didn't play for long that night, but I got my time down to a blazing fast 107.883. I didn't even watch the world record, I was just freestyling with the combo the current record used. From there, for the next month and a half, I shaved off the seconds, eventually getting a 103.333 on September 23rd. After that, a massive gap in time, where one of two things happened, maybe both. I either got bored and went back to playing competitive Smash Ultimate, or I got busy with college and had no time to play. Like I said, probably both. One random day in January 2020 saw another PR, down to a 103.283 and then back to dormancy. For while well, Almond's 750 reigned dominant, I was competing as a collegiate athlete. When March rolled around and everything grinded to a halt, so too did my athletics, and also my computer at the time. I ended up getting this laptop for a replacement, specifically for playing games and streaming. I mainly streamed Smash Ultimate lobbies for the very start of my streaming career, but one day in June I was bored of it. Ultimate arenas require other people to actually make things interesting, and as a small streamer with friends that have schedules of their own, I was not getting any kind of viewership, let alone people joining. And then it hit me. I started playing Big Blue again, a few weeks after getting my new computer. Why not stream PB attempts? That first Big Blue stream is still up on my archive channel, and ended in another new personal best, a 103.016. From there, my skills started to evolve. I got my first 102 one day after Ronnie's 700, and by the time he got his 666, I'd gotten down another 0.1. July 2020 saw perhaps my biggest growth as a time trialer. The 102.816 that I had at the start of the month was beaten by over a second, and I entered August with a 101.733. The cycle of improving every big blue stream continued until August 6th, when I played for NINE HOURS STRAIGHT and didn't improve. However, that extra time I played turned out to be for my benefit long term. Firstly, it served as a learning experience to set limits for myself on how much I should play at any given point. More importantly, my stream got found by members of the time trial community, who then reached out to me via chat and eventually sent me an invite to the MK Leaderboards Discord server. Once there, I learned that the time I set was already in the American Top 10 which totally surprised me. Up to that point, I had just copied Ronnie 666 to the best of my ability and didn't bother trying to make contact with or ask help from anyone. Eventually, however, I did get advice from players who were better than me at the track, like P, whose advice really helped me the most. Thanks to him, I started seeing more places to improve, and my record kept going down. On December 7th, 2020, I subbed 101. I was only the fourth American player to pass that threshold and 17th person overall. A month later, I beat Jimmy for the title of American Record, and simultaneously broke into the worldwide top 10, with a 100.850 on January 23rd, 2021. I went on another drought after that, eventually being knocked out of the top 10 and not even improving until July 1st, where I improved by a single frame. This is the last big blue PB I ever set on stream. A month after that, I got back into the top 10, or rather, top 16. That's right, the 9-way tie. Still by far my most viewed video. The night I uploaded that video, 
Alpha improved his time, then Alberto a few days later. Then on August 16th, another player came in and knocked the other seven out of the top ten. I kept chipping away at my time, eventually getting down to a 750. And then something changed. One Thursday, while I was streaming my usual Big Blue attempts, Alpha came into my chat. During our conversation, he tells me to try going for five coins on the first panel instead of the usual four. I doubt him at first, but try it out anyways. That stream never went public on the Archive channel, as the two of us decided to keep the strategy to ourselves until we both got world record. This is called hoarding, a somewhat controversial occurrence within speedrunning as a whole, but I think it's fine so long as records aren't being needlessly hoarded for copious amounts of time. That's right, I helped Alpha develop the 5 coin strat. Now you might have noticed I said we agreed to keep the strat secret until we both got record, but only Alpha actually got record. What happened? Simple answer, we took too long. This stream happened January of 2022, and Alpha's record wasn't until May. Throughout February, we both tried to improve with this new strat. I ended up improving by another frame, down to 733, but Alpha didn't improve his 666 at all. We were trying to get at least something before the release of the Booster Course Pass, but failed. After the Wave 1 hype died down, we got back to grinding. On April 24th, I improved by another frame and got back into the top 10 again, but I was still hoarding, and that wasn't either of our goals anyways. But the biggest problem had yet to arise. On April 28th, another American showed up on the leaderboards with a 683. It was Miguel. At this point, Miguel had been dormant in 8 Deluxe for almost three years, so his return marked the start of the Miguel jump scare trend. It also made Alpha and I panic, as we figured he was going for record. And him getting record would mean Ronnie would return, which meant, at best, we'd be hoarding even longer. And at worst, someone else playing the track would find the strat and get record instead. By this point, Alpha had already tied Ronnie, so it was just on me and my inability to get good S3 splits. On May 1st, I got my own 683 and called it good enough. I still regret that decision today, but perhaps it was a good thing, as I didn't end up beating 633 that year. Later in May, I improved to 666 after Ronnie took the track down to 533. My run was fourth worldwide when it was set, behind Ronnie, Alpha, and Miguel who'd improved to 650 with 5 coin. Ten days later, that same 666 was now 11th. And that's another factor I haven't mentioned yet. The sheer number of people good at this track, and save for like five players, all of them Japanese. No other track sees this level of domination from any country. In fact, when Alpha and I unhoarded, 10th worldwide was 0 .067 from record. Four frames. I've gone on record countless times calling the Big Blue Top 10 a mountain of gravel, because you have to actively keep climbing, or else you'll slide right down and out in no time. By the way, that 666 was the last time I was ever in the Top 10 on Big Blue. Despite countless attempts, my next improvement didn't come until September 6th, another measly one frame improvement to 650. I felt like I was cursed. Nothing was going right for me there. Despite countless record fails and paces well above the caliber suggested by my PB, I could never break through. 2022 ended on a sour note for me, where I felt like nothing would ever go right. And this thought process persisted until February 21st, where finally, I'd improved by more than one frame. Finally beat run 633. Finally take advantage of an insane pace, and finally get American record back. And that's where my time stands today. By far the best of my 96 times, despite it being set before any balance patches. The reason that I reacted no! the way I did, because I estimated before this project started that it would take me an entire month just to beat my big blue time. I've tried a couple of times to improve my PB with Slims since the balance patch, but always moved on quickly afterwards. Remember when I said only two players caught on to using slim tires on Big Blue right after Wave 4? I mentioned one of them was Ronnie, but the other one was me. 
Heck, I used them day one. Although, that day I had other priorities. This time, though, nothing is going to stop me from taking this PB down. I hope. Let's get to work. Yeah, that's fitting. Well, I guess it's time. I'm having trouble even deciding, like, what ghost to race. Oh yes, this is the first of several tracks that will take multiple playing sessions to improve. So don't be surprised if there are stream clips and call audio mixed in with the usual of just me. This is also the first track where I race a ghost that is not my own. Over here to the left is the name of the person whose ghost I'm racing, their splits, and the date this clip was captured. Be warned, there are a lot of S3 fails. Oh yeah, another thing I have to do, for Big Blue specifically, ladies and gentlemen, introducing the Keybind. At one particular turn in Section 3, there's a hairpin where you have to hold hard right, and you have to do it perfectly, otherwise you will not get a PB. You, you will not. Get it perfectly or die. Those are your options. And uh, my controller has trouble holding hard right. I don't know if it's a skill issue or a hardware issue. Don't care. So I remapped my X button to left D-pad to get a guaranteed 90 degree turn. That stupid hairpin is going to be the death of me. It already is the death of me. The sole reason my name isn't on MK World Records as having had Big Blue World Record at some point is because of that stupid hairpin. It is literally, get it perfect or die. Anytime I fail a pace there anymore, like when I was at my quote-unquote prime when I got my 600, way before then even, I stopped clipping fails to that point, because there were just too many. I didn't care to document them all, because they all fell to the same stupid thing. Spoiler alert, that's in my opinion the worst part of the track. By far. I remember after each of the last few PRs I set here, like a week afterwards, thinking, oh crap. This could be the last one I set here. And not for lack of trying, either. And honestly, if not for this Race Against the Calendar project, and also the balance patches, maybe this 600 would be the last time I set here. Maybe it still will be. Maybe this will be the death of Race Against the Calendar. I don't know. And I don't like that I don't know. Do I need therapy? Well, that's the first one oh oh. That's a nice S1. Three milliseconds for my best split. Neat. Too early. That was like a TAS hairpin though, what the heck? Nice. Real nice. I hate that stupid turn. One millisecond from my best split. I see. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, I'm glad I wasn't on pace when that happened. Ugh. That's the exact way Alberto failed a couple of days ago. Oh. Perfectly what the? timed sound. Who played that? Lol. I, 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 how do you tie a summit record that's already kind of unoptimized? And what's, how? what's, how do you do what's that? funny is, Chino literally tied me the morning after I set that run. <laughs> that's just, it's just, it's how, how, how. The odds of that are so fucking slim. Like the tires. Like the tires. <laughs> So you both are so bad. Making sure the audio is working. Yes. Welcome to the first of hopefully not very many big blue streams this year. Because why did I have to roll this fourth? What is my current time? 100.600. World record is a uh, 100.401. I am 199 milliseconds behind record. And guess what spot worldwide I am? Yeah, that's right, 23rd. S3 needed to improve just any point seven. Wait, hold on. Okay. Why was that close? Nice best split. Why was that close? Well. Isn't this just a, an interesting turn of events? Yeah, the gains were... Like, I'm glad I took a clip, because... Okay. Like, especially in this section. I gained, like... I want to say 30 milliseconds just right here. And then, insane hairpin. Kind of wacko wall hit. That was interesting. Green path was really good. I didn't miss any boost panels. And then just look at me game there. When do I get S3s like that? The answer is never. That was the best split. Thank you, Orphan Trick. That was a decent pace. Sadly, I suck at S3. I guess that's just the story of my life, though. I wonder how good that S3 would have been. I don't think that was a pace, but that looked to be a generally pretty decent S3. Oh, fail corrections. Hit me up. Big Deluxe doesn't even have TAS yet. Why am I saying that? Uh -huh. Stop. Why? Ah.
Are you for real? Are you for real? All I had to do was not screw up. And I missed the rail. By not very much as well. Ugh. That was so free. And that S1 was insane. It wasn't BKS, but it was pretty good. I'm mad. I hate this stupid turn. My finger locked. That corner is underrated for, or rather, under hated. Because now you can't go the tightest possible there, or you'll get flung out. Very normal track, very normal gameplay. Interesting. In case it wasn't obvious, I hate that stupid turn. How interesting. That's, uh... Huh. A poor S2 and a mediocre S3. Ain't that just the story of my big blue career? I don't know why I went, uh, western with that accent. But, uh, we roll with it, I guess. One thing I find funny is that the way you approach 5-coin with slim tires versus leaf tires is entirely different. The way you do it with leaf tires is optimal overall. So you might be thinking, why not just do it with slim tires? You literally can't do it with slim tires because you are too fast. You do not stay in the coin panel long enough to grab five coins. If you take the leafs line with slims, you have to approach it differently with slims. Just be normal. Please just be normal. Rara S3 failed to bad driving instead of failed strats. Either way, though, I still suck. Very normal frame rule track. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I hate that stupid hairpin. Did I ever say how much I hate this stupid trick? <sighs> the cycle continues. When will it end? The trick. Ladies and gentlemen, hairpin trick. Ladies and gentlemen, hairpin trick. Nice. Missed fast glider. No drift! This game sucks! Missed the MT. And now I get a good hairpin trick. Screw you. How was I behind there? LOL. He who cannot do sections other than one. I just want a PR, man. That hairpin trick that I hate! How was that a five coin? How was that a five coin? How was that not a five coin if the previous one was? I need, I, let's look at this. I need to do like a frame count of how many frames you have to be on the coin panel. To get a fifth coin. Yeah, uh, hi, editing cue here. I've just done a frame by frame analysis of this clip, uh, currently in the process of editing it, and uh, going back to the beginning, for this five coin, I'm in the coin panel for 59 frames, approximately. For this non five coin, I'm in it for 58. It was a literal one frame difference. That's wild. No. No. Bad controller. No drifting. Bad control stick. No drifting. Drifting is for the ZR button. Not you. You stupid piece of plastic. How was that behind? I pressed the stupid button too early. I hate this stupid trick! Why do you exist? Nice boost panel, miss.
What's funny is I don't think that would have been a PR. Even if I had hit the railing. Fellas, that right there is what we call a failure. See, now, that would normally count as a best split S1. But did you catch my coin count after I crossed the line? I didn't get that tenth coin. So by technicality, it's no good. That's right, everyone. We're in part two of Big Blue. I was hoping this wouldn't happen, but alas, here we are. And... If y'all are wondering, this is what my clips look like right now. Anyways, let's play the game, shall we? So the thing about Onigiri's Ghost... He does four coin. Why does he do that? I, he's stupid, I guess. I don't know. Makes for a good S1 ghost race, because his S1 is a 409. What? How was that not an SMT? How did I fail to that part of Hairpin? I hate this stupid hairpin. Why do you exist? Why are you like this? Why can't you just be normal? Why was that actually close? I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Why? Someone please tell Onigiri to learn five coin. Oh my gosh. I don't think this is it. Yeah. Once again, we are live, and once again, we are playing Big Blue. That's a best split. Well, we got past the hairpin, but, yeah. However, that 358 is actually a best split. Also, the milliseconds of S2 are not supposed to be slower than the milliseconds of S1. Just saying. I missed the SMT. And I hopped over the boost panel. Bruh! 
We're, we're just over 30 minutes into the stream. It's happening. It's gonna happen. Did he really just get two good hairpins in a row? Dude, that hairpin was tass. I didn't break, and I got a perfect line. That was insane. <laughs> I'm glad that was at the very start of a run. I have failed PRs to sneezing. Uganda Knuckles was the beginning of the end. Yeah, you got the double at the beginning of the end. Yeah, that one period of memes where memes just collapsed on themselves and we got deep fried Markiplier Farquad E. <laughs> <laughs> where memes just collapsed on themselves and we got deep fried Markiplier Farquad E. <laughs> no E, just deep fried Markiplier Farquad. That's it. What? <laughs> Because I so said weird. the E on my end. I said the E. It just did it go didn't through go somehow. <laughs> How was that not a trick? How was that not a trick? Uh huh. Well, ain't that just unfortunate? I've won. That's a best split. Is this it? Are you for real? Oh, that green path ruined everything. <laughs> Three thirty in the morning. That was a tops fail. That was a tops fail. Holy crap. Am I not dead? Ladies and gentlemen, the TBPD. That abbreviation or acronym it stands for Tactical Boost Panel Dodge. That is explanatory in and of itself. Huge disc.
And I only get good S2s off bad S1s. What is this? That's also a best split, mind you. It's by one millisecond, but still. Oh, that means I've improved all three of my best splits this project now. Awesome. I hate this game, it's so bad. I think you guys get the point, so I'm just going to stop it here. This is only a fraction of the fails I've had, and a small reminder to myself as to why I took such a long break from the track. I've failed paces well into the point four range, yet my time remains a 600. I'm losing time not only in this race against the calendar, but also in making content. So for the sake of both myself and my channel, I'm going to break my own rules and call it here. I'm still going to be playing from time to time between other tracks, if only so I can avoid doing this again in late December. Plus this video is already big enough, so once I eventually do improve here, the rest of the gameplay will be its own... Hey, wait, what's going on in the background? I actually got the SMT there? Hold on it. Hold on. Please, for the love of God, be it. We did it! Oh my gosh, it's not even AR, but I don't care. That S1 is insane. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, we did it. You know what? Post-commentary queue? I think I'm actually gonna take pick up what you said and keep playing this in between courses because I can get a much better time than this like that s3 still sucks that s1 is insane s2 is okay and then s3 pfft. now I'm gonna pull a sneaky I'm gonna not upload this until the video comes out <laughs> Nobody knows. Those of you watching, this is the first you will see. Or at least that was the plan. Editing this video took genuinely longer than it did to improve. So I started playing again to keep up appearances. And managed to improve again. This time actually getting American record, if only by a few milliseconds and thus revealing to a few more people that I had actually improved. Y you want to know something funny? I said this last month, and I've been editing ever since. I hate you. Even though I feel like my time here is still much more improvable than it was before, I'm at least glad the biggest hurdle by far is now out of the way. I'm happy. I'm happy with this. So, that was Big Blue. My enjoyment of this track feels more nostalgic than real at this point, because I've been playing it for so long. It hasn't even been a quarter of my life, but at the same time I feel like I've been doing this forever. Perhaps that's due to how much has changed in my life since I started playing, although that's not necessarily due to Big Blue itself. There's still so much that I didn't get to talk about, like all the players that have played this track at a level near or above my own, yet never got a world record. The gameplay I put here was maybe 5% of my actual time playing the track this year. But I believe that what I did talk about, and show, was sufficient. I don't know if or when I'll ever stop playing this. I don't know if I can even get a world record here anymore. My initial reason for getting into time trials in the first place. But I'm still gonna be here, playing for myself. 
And like I said, I'll be playing this in the downtime between the rest of the tracks. Honestly, if I've learned anything across this multi-year journey, these three things stand out the most. One, dark times are only temporary. Even if it feels like it'll last forever and you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, it's a lot closer than you think. Two, it's important to take breaks, especially if your mental state isn't exactly in a good place. Rest assured, whatever you're doing will still be there when you come back, or it wasn't worth stressing over in the first place. And finally, third, keep following your dreams. Even if you end up falling short, or not even coming close at all. Take a look around you. Who knows? Maybe, just maybe, you found something even better along the way. Thanks for watching. Oh, right, I have to roll the next track. Honestly, so long as it's not something like DK Summit or Calamari Desert next, I'll be fine. 89, that's another Wave 6 track. Uh, is that Rome? I think that's Rome. Alright, next episode we're traveling to Italy. Not actually, but y y you know what I mean. <sighs> we cleared the biggest hurdle. Should be smooth sailing from here. <laughs>